There are several terms that are associated with kinship um, that are important to understand in order to understand how kin systems work. Um, the first term is consanguinal relations. Consanguinal, uh, as you might be able to tell if you know your Latin roots, consanguine, with blood, um, means someone who is understood to be related through shared blood. Um, now, this does not necessarily always map onto how the West understands what count as shared blood, but these are people that we understand ourselves to be related to through blood relatives. So in the United States, um, we, in where, where we recognize, uh, our, a ambi we're an ambilineal society, so we recognize our, uh, our descendants, both through our mother and through our father, a blood relative, a consanguinal relative might be a mother, uh, if she's a birth mother, a, a father, if they're the progenitor, um, the mother's mother, mother's father, etc. Um, in other societies, for example, in a matrilineal society where you recognize your descent through the mother's side of your family, your mother might be your consanguinal relative, your uh, relative through shared blood, but your father, we'll talk about exactly how they're, you're related to them. You are related to them, but you're related to them because your mother is married to them. So there's not an understanding that there's shared blood. So what I want to emphasize over here is that we're not talking about biology, we're talking about social con constructs. So the consanguinal are those people that you understand yourself to be related to through shared blood. A final relations are those relations that are understood to uh, happen through contractual relationships. Um, so these, in every society, we recognize that there are people that we're related to through blood, and there are other people that we're related to through contract, but who falls into which category might be different from one society to another. There are three types of contracts that we frequently uh, recognize in kinship studies and anthropology. The first one that's probably um, the most, the one that kind of pops to mind most easily to most Westerners um, are legal contracts. So a marriage contract, for example, uh, assuming we're talking about the legal version of marriage, um, would be uh, would be a, and a final relative. So if you get married, you become a final relatives. You be, become relatives through marriage. Another one that you might think of is adoption. Um, so it's not that we suddenly believe that we're related to each other through shared blood. We understand that there's a contract, um, but they're nonetheless family, right? So you, you become family through the contract. So uh, legal contracts are probably the ones that are easy, uh, easiest to pop to mind, uh, but they're certainly not the only type of contract. Um, a second very common one would be religious contracts. Uh, so these may or may not also have legal correlations, uh, but uh, as anthropologists we recognize that not all contracts have legal paperwork to go with them. Some contracts, for example religious contracts, could or could not have the correlations. Again, a marriage would be a good example of that. Many uh, marriages, especially in the United States, have both a legal and a religious contract, but you could have a wedding, a marriage that has only one or the other. Um, and so, for example, the religious contract contract that happens when you say, you know, that we, uh, in, uh, as God is our witness, we will do this and that, and um, uh, etc., you know, whatever, depending on the religion, there might be different uh, contracts. That's probably the most common one, but Godparents might be another great example of a religious contract that you enter into. So um, when you, so for those people who have godparents in Catholicism, for example, um, you when you go to the church and make a contract between uh, the two individuals in uh, as uh, God is is a witness or God kind of uh, condones this uh, this contract, that would be a religious contract. And the third form of contract, this is the one that is uh, probably most unfrequently talked about in everyday society, but as anthropologists we find equally or probably maybe even more important are social contracts. So there are kin kinship uh, ties that we forge that may not have a legal contract and they may not have a religious contract, but that doesn't make them any less real to us in terms of our everyday experiences. And since anthropologists are really interested in people's everyday experiences, we, are, uh, we feel that it's very important to acknowledge the social contracts. So what do we mean by social contracts? So how many of you have an auntie or a cousin 
or maybe even a sister or brother that you know that you're not really aunties or uncles or cousins. You know that there's not a legal contract over there. Um, and so anthropologists will say, well, there might not really be a legal contract, but there really is a social contract. And the moment they use kinship terminology, so you call somebody an auntie or an uncle, or you refer to someone as your cousin, or maybe even your sister or brother, anytime you use a kinship term, anthropologists acknowledge that as just as real, sometimes even more real, than any legal or religious contract, because it shapes our everyday experiences in very profound ways. So. A final contracts are, uh, oh, sorry, a final relations are those that are understood to be through a country, uh, through a social contract. Sorry, a final relations are those that are understood to come into being through contract, through a legal contract, through a religious contract, or through a social contract.